Hello everyone, we just wanted to welcome you back to our series, Context. Hello if you're watching live with us with the house group or if you're watching at a later date. We're so glad that you're joining us for this series. If you aren't already, be sure to follow us on Instagram at the house 901 That way you can stay up to date with all that we're doing. Also, you can send us a message and let us know how we can pray for you. And we can also help you get uh, further connected that way. Uh, well, thanks for joining and we'll see you next time. Hey, how are you guys doing? Uh, Randy Odom uh, with The House, and I have with me uh, my wonderful wife, Calandria, and we're excited about the opportunity to uh, continue this segment on our teaching for context. Uh, how do we see God's Word? How do we take the right lens of uh, context and look at God's Word so that we might have the, the, a deeper meaning um, through a Middle Eastern lens, because we know that the, the Bible was written uh, in the Middle Eastern context, and Jesus uh, was Jewish. And so we want to take take that lens and, and look through God's Word. And one of the things that we talked about was looking at the, the passage of uh, the Samaritan woman at the well. But before we get to that scripture, we want to set up a runway of certain um, areas of context that are important to look at. Um, and so, wouldn't you say so, Collider? All right. The first one we're going to look at um, is the cultural context, um, the Jewish context. Um, now, it, it's important to say, and I, I do want to give honor where honors due. My wife is, is helping me. She's, she's walking me through this study, and it's called Jesus and Women of the Bible. Um, uh, Christy McClellan has introduced, has created that and introduced that to my wife. And I noticed that what she was studying and I just started to go, hey, I, I want to know more about that too. And so I would encourage you guys, uh, the people that you're around, the people that God brings into your space, if you see them growing in God's word, be a sponge. That's onto that. Um, God uses different people to help people grow and he's using my wife to help me grow. And so I'm, I'm proud of that. Um, but we want to look at the Jewish culture. Uh, and, and what does that mean? Jesus was distinctly Jewish. Um, the Jewish culture looks at things in different ways than uh, the American culture or, or the, the Eastern culture looks at certain things in a different lens or a different view than the Western culture. And one of those uh, hot topics in, in our culture today is justice and righteousness. Um, the Middle Eastern culture tends to focus on honor and shame, where a Western viewpoint focuses on guilt and innocence, right and wrong. And as we walk through this passage of, of the Samaritan woman at the well, you'll see how Jesus navigates these issues from a particularly Jewish standpoint. Um, Kalandra, we talked about how... Uh, Racism and prejudice isn't, isn't new because the Jews and the Samaritans had hundreds of years of racial tensions. Wouldn't you say? Uh, about 700 years. So um, the northern kingdom of Israel was taken captive by the Assyrians and God had told them that they shouldn't intermarry with the enemy or the culture that they were living in. Um, but they did, and then as a result, the Samaritan culture was born out of that. And the Samaritan culture um, was looked down upon by the southern kingdom, which was um, the kingdom of Judah, which was made up of two of the tribes of Israel. The northern kingdom had the first ten. Um, and so the, um, Jew the southern kingdom judged the northern kingdom for this and looked down upon them. So. Um, if we have geographical context, we have the northern kingdom, Samaria is in the middle, uh, and the southern kingdom of Judah. And every time um, the Jewish people of the north wanted to worship in Jerusalem, which was in the southern kingdom, they have to travel through Samaria. And so there was a lot of animosity between these two cultures because the, the southern kingdom burned um, the Samaritan temple. Samaritans had gotten to a point where they didn't want to worship in uh, Jerusalem, so they built their own temple. And um, 
the Israelites were not happy with that and burned their temple. So hold on. They were so angry, so much racial tension, that they burned their church down. And in response, <laughs> the Samaritan um, people um, on Passover put bones into the Jewish temple. So they desecrated the Jewish temple by Y'all understand that those racial tensions were so high that those things happened, and we see that we see that racial tension is is high even now. So that's not a new thing. So we can apply the scriptures. We can apply what God's gonna what what Jesus does and what He teaches us in this passage. We can apply that right now in the culture that we see. Yeah, it would have been the equivalent of. Uh, someone replacing your Christmas tree on Christmas morning and all your presents with a corpse. That's how, um, you know. They was fighting mad. They, they, that, 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 that was real anger. And so we see that cultural context plays into this. You said 400 years. Seven. 700 years. See, I got, li I got context. He's helping me with that. 700 years. 700 years of anger, frustration, fighting. And so when we come to the New Testament, um, now the children of Israel are in uh, um, the Roman culture, the Greek culture. They are um, not wanting to repeat the sins of the past. And so a lot of the rabbis of that time spoke out against the Hellenistic um, customs of um, that were pretty prevalent of that day, a lot of heathenistic cultures and um, ceremonies. And so to prevent um, or to discourage the Jewish men from participating in these things, these um, orgies and worshiping different deities, they came up with um, these different um, rules to try to discourage the men from interacting with the women. And so some of those uh, rules were that, you know, they couldn't speak to women, uh, that women were somehow um, sinful in nature and they couldn't be trusted and shouldn't be trusted with land or property or um, legal matters. But in some way that transferred not only to the women outside of the Jewish community, but it became prevalent within the Jewish community and they transferred those same beliefs to their own wives. So hold on, Let, let's make sure we understand that and I wanna understand that. So you're telling me that the, that the Jewish priests, Pharisees set up rules because they didn't wanna commit the sins of the past and they set up such strict rules and regulations that the rules and regulations made women really segregated. They didn't have a voice. And so think about it, you guys. That's the same thing a lot of churches have done today. Because they don't want to sin, fall into sin, we set up rules and regulations to guard us from such things instead of leaning into Jesus. Uh, and so that's very interesting how history repeats itself. But, but it's important because during that time, all of those rules and regulations, the disciples would have known that, the, the culture would have known this. So it is a really big deal that Jesus is approaching a woman, a Samaritan woman, in the noonday hour and speaking to her. Rabbis did not uh, speak theology with women. Um, but Jesus spoke theology with women, with this woman. That's amazing. And so you can see Jesus, you can see this runway where all of these cultural norms, the gospel makes them null and void. The gospel brings in what is truth. Jesus meets this woman where she is. He speaks to her. He not only speaks to her, but he asks her for a drink. Now, in the passage, she don't have two cups. She didn't have another cup to draw from, so she, he's asking her for a drink. And, and, and that's just amazing to me that in this, in this context, we, we, if, we, if we dig in and we use the right lens and we, we, we say, 
why is this happening? What does this teach me about God? What does it teach me about Jesus? Then we can see that, that he is compassion. He, he brings, think about the shame that, that this woman was experiencing from just the culture. You, you, you're not given a voice, no, you know, you're pretty much an outcast, being a Samaritan woman to the Jewish culture. Well, there are two different sets of um, thought in that day. There, there was um, uh, a rabbi named, um, I hope they get this right, Hillel, and one named Shammai, and they had two different um, thoughts of teaching. One took the Bible very literally, the other one took the Bible for, uh, at its word. Um, but they each kind of professed different thoughts about divorce. Um, one said that you could divorce a woman if um, she upset you in some way or burned the toast or offended you in some way. The other said that the only reason for divorce was in cases of adultery. And even then, only men were allowed to divorce women. Women didn't have any legal rights. They weren't allowed to testify in court. They couldn't be witnesses. And uh, in the case of the Samaritan woman, um, one of the rabbis said that even the spittle of a Samaritan woman was considered to be um, unclean, um, offensive. And so um, it is pretty significant that Jesus, in the passage that we're going to read, initiates contact with a woman, asks her for a drink, knowing that he doesn't have anything to draw water with, which means that he would have had to drink after her. Um, mm. The Samaritan woman knows this, uh, she knows that Jewish men don't typically associate with um, Samaritan men, especially rabbis, and they definitely would have known that in that culture, her uh, spittle would have been considered unclean. And um, uh, I should say in their culture, it was common to drink after other people. Uh, it's not like we think of today, but um, she would have known that, and she knew that Jesus obviously knew that. And um, so when she says, um, how can you ask me for a drink? You are Jew and I'm Samaritan. Um, she was quite aware that, that this was not the norm. Mm. Mm. That's so important. You see why it's important to, to, to have the right context because it opens up the scriptures to you rather than just glancing through it. Um, so those are the areas of context we, we wanna encourage you to look at when you read God's scripture. Cultural, what is the culture of the day? Um, what's going on in that, in that space? Historical, uh, what's, what's the history? Uh, geographic, you know, uh, the Northern Southern Kingdom, it's kinda of like they wouldn't, they wouldn't pass through that, that area, they'd go around, it's like, if. You know, let's just be real. In Memphis, people go, man, that neighborhood, that's not a good neighborhood. I'm going to go around that neighborhood. That's how they looked at the nation of Samaria. And then uh, we want to look at also the, the, the Hebrew Jewish culture because they looked at things and they viewed things in a much more communal, community-based viewpoint. And like I said before, we'll get into this when we dig, get into the, the, the next segments of this, uh, of this series. But, but the Jewish culture looked at justice and righteousness with a honor and shame lens rather than a guilt and innocent lens. And we'll see how, how Jesus brings honor to this woman who was shamed and how he lifts her up to a place of honor because in the end of this passage, she actually testifies to the community. She, she becomes an evangelist of what Jesus Christ has done. Uh, which before she wouldn't have had a voice. And, and to me, Calandria, one of the most f fascinating things is that we are sitting here thousands of years later talking about this woman. Yeah. And it was also the first time that Jesus declared he is Lord. He said, I am he. He didn't make this declaration the first time. Uh, and and Miss McClellan makes this statement in her book, in the Bible you can only have one first. 
Like you can only, it can only have, if, if something happens one time, that's the first. You can't have another first. And so think about it. Jesus declares, I am he, I am the Lord. He, I am he to a Samaritan woman at a well, not to a man, not to a, not to a, a Pharisee, not to a Sadducee, but to a Samaritan woman at the well. That, that to me, that is amazing in that Jesus meets us where we are. And there's seven, uh, I, Jesus has a lot of I am statements in the Bible where he tries to uh, use uh, things that people would fam be familiar with in their environment to help reveal to him, to them, his nature. He says, I am the way, I am the vine, I am uh, the good shepherd, um, I am the bread of life. Um, but there's only one time um, in scripture that we find that he says, I am the Messiah. Even in, during the crucifixion, when he was asked if he was a Messiah, he said, you have spoken. But the one and only time that he reveals himself as a Messiah is to um, the Samaritan woman, a woman who had been divorced five times, um, a woman who was with a man at the time that was not her husband, um, and a woman who had, by all accounts, been ostracized even by the Samaritan culture that she was a part of. Because she, um, when we talk about context of um, cultural context, it was usually pretty common for women to get up early in the morning and go with other women um, to get water. Um, but we find this woman going in the heat of the day by herself. She doesn't have anybody to go with her. She doesn't have anybody to help carry her water. Um, a term, haver, is a term that means um, a life partner that someone you walk through life with, like to disciple you, you talk scripture with them, you hold each other accountable, um, you carry each other's water. You she didn't have her crew. She didn't have any crew. She, as, as we would say, as, as guys would say, she didn't have no boy. He didn't have no, I don't have no boys. She didn't have no girls. She didn't have no girls with no her. Squad. No she squad. Was she, she was squad. She wasn't squad deep. She was squad less. The, and that right there. So let's just think about that. She has no Javier to carry the water to walk with life, to walk with her through life. But the minute she receives Christ and recognizes him as Lord and Savior, she is now in the family of Christ. So now she has brothers and sisters in the body where before she had none. Come on. If, if that don't get you excited. I, I, I think we probably should. Um, I mean, just in, as, as you read the passage, um, the fact that she was shamed ostracized. Um, in modern times, it would be the equivalent of a pastor asking a stripper to help him let him hold $20. So if you put it in context that you can see how scandalous this moment was. Um, and the fact that Jesus was willing to see this woman and he didn't identify her by her shame when he asked her to go um, bring back her husband's her husband he actually identified her shame and um, to the degree that she had been shamed um, biblical justice or is the idea of in the eastern culture when the honorable reaches down to the shameful and restores them to a place of honor and this woman had been relegated to um, extreme shame. So um, in return, she would need extreme honor. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways that he honored her was by one, uh, engaging in conversation with her as a rabbi, um, asking her for a drink of water, saying that he would be willing to drink after her, uh, which uh, um, I just feel that that's showing that he's identifying with her humanity. Sometimes we forget to see people as human. We try to identify them by the things that they've done. Um, we try to look at them or judge them based on 
their actions or their circumstances and we forget to see their humanity. Mm -hmm. Jesus saw her as uh, created in his image and his likeness and he um, speaks to her. Uh, not only does he speak to her, he talks theology with her about where their worship, where, um, uh, when the Messiah will come. Um, he offers her living water um, and he declares himself to her as the Messiah. And they had been waiting 400 years at this point um, from the Old Testament to the New Testament for the Messiah to come. So this was a huge declaration and the fact that he was willing to share that with her um, just restores her to a place of honor. And if you can imagine someone being so wounded that they didn't have any support, that um, the point that the, she had been divorced five times and the fact that men were the only people that could divorce at that time um, says that five times men had broken their covenant with her, um, had decided not to honor their role as protector, honor their role as uh, provider. Um, and we don't know specifically why they decided to do that, whether it was um, because of adultery on her part or adultery on their part. Uh, we do know that in that society, if a woman is caught in adultery, then the punishment for that, or a man it's for death. that matter, if a woman or man is caught in adultery, the punishment for that in that culture in that time was death. So the fact that this has happened five times um, could lend to that it was just a case of the Jewish men or Samaritan men of that time um, saying that she offended them in some way, she burnt the toast, she didn't have the meal on time, she let her hair down in public, um, she spun around in the street too fast. Um, any of those things would have been offensive. So um, it, it could be because of those things that she was divorced. Um, but any, by any account, if she's divorced five times, you can imagine uh, the culture wondering what is wrong with you that you can't keep a man? What is wrong with you that this has happened to you five times? And on top of that, that she was Samaritan. On top of that. Yes. And so what we're going to do now is let's read through the passage because next time we meet, Calandra is going to be with us again, and we're going to dig deeper into this passage with these cultural lens on so that we have the right context. But I want to read through the passage. I'm going to read through it slowly and then we'll, 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 we'll wrap up. And this is, this is found in Luke. Go ahead, you want to say something? I was just going to okay. say, we probably need to do the background first of what happened prior to that before. Yes, let's do that. Okay. Let's give that. Um, so before uh, Jesus met this woman at the well, he was going from the northern kingdom to the southern kingdom for a festival in uh, Jerusalem. So he had to travel through Samaria and he sends um, James and John to find housing for him in Samaria instead of traveling through. And the culture is a very um, hospitable culture. So uh, one of the ways that you show hospitality is by allowing people to come to your home to stay. Uh, you wash their feet, you anoint their head with oil. Um, so he sends them to go. And in um, Luke 9, verses um, 31 through 35, it says, As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set for, out for Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead who went into Samaria village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples James and John saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them and they went to another village. So Jesus basically asked them to go 
and asked for lodging, but the Samaritans rejected them. They didn't want any parts of them in their, their town or their village. And so they were like, no, we'll pass. And so uh, James and John are so upset, you know, that they rejected their, that they rejected Jesus. They're like, you want us to go down and call down fire from heaven and just kill all of them? And Jesus is like, no. I mean, I can see Jesus. James and John were also known as the sons of thunder. So they, could you imagine? Jesus, let's Bo just. Bow energies. Bow energies, the sons of thunder. Jesus, let's just kill all of them because they didn't let us come to their house. Yes. And Jesus is like, we know some folks who are kind of like that. Oh, you going to reject my boy? Yeah, oh, you going to okay. reject my boy? I'm burning your house down. And Jesus is like, no, no, no. So on the tail end of that, this happens. All right? So let's give a reading of John chapter 4. Um, and, and as I read this, I want you guys to see it. You might close your eyes where you are. You might just try to focus and see it through those areas of context that we just laid out. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard, had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it was that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given the you the living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you're right in saying that I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true, the woman said to him. Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Just then, the disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, what do you seek or why are you talking to her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out to the town and were coming to him. So in that passage, you see, uh, you see everything that Jesus did to bring this woman honor and lift her up out of shame. And if you read on, uh, you'll see that she went back into the town and she shared the gospel. And uh, the, the men actually say, we believe not only because of what you say, but because we, we, we saw Jesus. And then they ask him to stay in the town for two more days. And we'll talk about that in our next segment, but we wanted to give a cursory reading of the passage. Um, it's our prayer that, that you'll begin to, to look at God's word uh, in its right context, in its true context, 
and that his word will become alive to you. And it won't just be that we're reading our Bible, but man, we are feasting from it, that God is filling us with his word um, so that we can be just like this Samaritan woman. Um, we can be taken from a place of shame, which we all have sinned, and that the gospel of Jesus Christ can lift us up to a place of honor because we honor him. And I just want to say before we, we end this time, this, this study by Christy McClellan is phenomenal. And I am enjoying my wife taking me through this study, and I'm learning a lot. Um, I'm learning a lot about women, which uh, any guy, uh, you can't ever learn enough, especially if you have a godly wife that, you're, that you are doing life with. Um, I'm thankful for you, Calandria, being here. And uh, I'm super excited about the house and what, where God has taken us uh, this year. So stay in touch with us. Plug into your house groups. Uh, the leaders are phenomenal. And um, yes, we are excited to be here. Um, yes, thank you for asking me. And uh, one thing I want to say about this study uh, is something that she emphasizes a lot uh, in uh, the Middle Eastern culture is reading from a lens of not what does this say about me and focusing on what does a passage say about me, but focusing on what does it say about Jesus? What does it say about God? What does it say about his character and his nature? And I hope that as you read this, you'll be encouraged to look at it and say, uh, what does it say about his nature and how he wants to respond not only to me, but to those around me, to the least of these, and to those in, in, in my spirit and influence. And so, thank you. Thank you, and we'll see you next time.